G'day and welcome back to the Weedy Garden. Another episode from the garden on the hill. Far away from any town and even further from the city. So I was up here on the hill eating some Panama berries, just minding my own business, when the telephone rang. Hello, Weedy here. Oh, hi, Weedy. Um, my name's Elle from Australian Medicinal Herbs. Um, I'm just calling. I love your videos, and I would really love it. Would you be able to teach me how to video so that I can teach people how to grow medicinal herbs? Well, actually, it's probably easier if you teach me how to grow the herbs than it is for me to teach you how to do the videos because that's quite difficult. So how about if I come down to you and you can show me how to grow the, the herbs and I'll make a video. Oh, that would be amazing. Okay. So, I headed south to Elle's Herb Garden. So I did a little bit of research on Elle, and actually she knows what she's talking about. She's not just any ordinary herb grower, she's got an award of merit from the Australian Institute of Horticulture for her dedication in growing, harvesting and marketing of medicinal herbs in Australia. She's also got the a silver medal in the Golden Leaf Awards for her hibiscus immunity tea. She's on the National Council of the Australian Institute of Horticulture. She's got certificate two, three and four in horticulture, and she's got a PDC in permaculture. Today on this video, we're both going to show you how to grow mullein, lemon balm, hibiscus, passion flower, and tulsi, also known as holy basil. So I grow these five medicinal herbs because they are very easy to grow in my area. They all taste delicious. They are all easy to process being aerial herbs and they're all medicinally magical. They all have certain properties that really genuinely help people. And with these five herbs, you kind of have a mini health food store in your backyard. So mullein is an amazing herb. It's fantastic for the respiratory system. In America, they call it mullein. In Australia, it's mullein or mullein. And so if you're a smoker, it's really helpful to get the gunk out of your lungs. In addition to that, it's good for all respiratory things such as hay fever, asthma, bronchial issues, used either as a tea or a tincture, and we can also smoke it as well. So if you have a look at the leaf and then you look at the really fine little hairs and you look at how fluffy it is, it looks like a lung. So if you're a smoker, you could use the mullein leaf as an alternative to tobacco and that would help to clear out your lungs, but it's also much better for you. Okay, so it's a leaf that you use in a tea or tincture and that's useful for your lungs. Whereas if you're going to use the flower of the plant, the flower of the plant is used in an oil for an ear infection or for throat infection. So you grow mullein from seed, you put it in in springtime, it needs rich alluvial soil and it likes lots of water and lots of sunshine and it does not like humidity. Where I am in northern New South Wales, it sort of dies off during winter because it's deemed to be an annual here. Whereas other places it's deemed to be perennial, such as Europe. It also likes granite country so it grows best up at those um, temperate granite areas. I wildcraft it, which is basically, I give some organic farmers up near Gaira a bottle of wine and the mullein grows there as a weed. So instead of having to grow it at my farm, I go up there and just harvest it from the wild in the tablelands areas in northern New South Wales. So when I collect mullein, my daughter and I take our van and we go out and camp out west. We'll harvest in the afternoon and then we'll stay in the van overnight and then hop up and harvest again in the morning. So it grows best during summer. You harvest it when it's about 30 centimetres around, like a dinner plate size. And it's really fluffy and it's a basal rosette. Harvest the whole thing. So you take the leaves that are fluffy and uh, succulent looking. When you're drying medicinal herbs, you want to have them out of the sunlight in a cool, dry place. I use natural drying methods, so I use fans to dry my herbs you want to make sure that you've got airflow to make sure there's no mold or anything like that. And you want to make sure that you don't use heat to dry them as it can ruin the medicinal properties of the herb. There's definitely two things that will kill mullein, frost 
and humidity. I've heard it's being called cowboy toilet paper. Um, yeah, I definitely wouldn't be using it as my toilet paper. It's super itchy. If you only have space to grow one herb in your garden, that's Tulsi or holy basil. It is also known as the incomparable one or the mother medicine of nature. It is so because Hindus worship it as being above all others in the medicine. So Tulsi is, it's an adaptogen. Adaptogen means that it helps your body respond to stress emotionally, physically, metabolically. So it helps to fix any sort of disorders that need to be regulated. So it literally regulates your body. Uh, menopause is a fantastic example of, um, it regulates mood, it regulates body temperature, it regulates sleep. All of the sort of things that go with menopause as a woman, Tulsi is your answer. If you were gonna go running a marathon, you would try having some Tulsi beforehand because it helps to regulate your body's stress responses. If you're going through a breakup or something similar to that, Tulsi is a good herb for you because it helps regulate emotional stress. You can plant Tulsi from either seed or cutting. Like a lot of plants, it lacks well-drained alluvial soil, lots of sunlight and some water. So harvesting the Tulsi, I chop from the top and as the plant develops and grows, it will shrub up into a nice shaped bush and when you're harvesting, you're looking for the nice fresh shoots of the green and purples in there. Those are the ones that are really full of those beautiful volatile oils. Tulsi is part of the basil family, so the Ockham family. So similar to basils, when you um, crush the plant, you know it's a, a decent quality plant when, and you can really smell that basil smell in the plant. And again, when you're harvesting the Tulsi, you make sure that you're storing in a cool, dry place, not in the sunlight and letting the fan dry it. And then we've got lemon balm. Lemon balm is really good for tummies. So um, if you've got a spazzy tummy, for example, or kids with um, digestive issues, constipation, those sorts of things. So lemon balm helps to relax your tummy because of its antispasmodic properties. It's really good for anxiety and melancholy. So people that are um, sort of like, they have a cloud above their head all the time and they sort of go through life like Eeyore, those people need lemon balm because it's actually a mood booster. Lemon balm's a nervine and it helps regulate and relax your central nervous system. So say for example, you're going to a job interview and you're really anxious and you're worried about it or to the mother-in-law's house or something like that, you would definitely have a tea of lemon balm or some tincture or something like that and that will help relax your central nervous system so you're just a bit more chill. You could also call it a chill tea. It has the chill factor. Yeah, lemon balm's really good for cold sores because of its antiviral properties. Uh, it sort of suppresses the cold sore virus. So to grow lemon balm, you would put it underneath a fruit tree, it likes some shade and it likes sort of rich alluvial soil that's well drained. It is a mint so it does like a bit of water. It likes a good chop back so if you're wanting to grow lemon balm and, and harvest from it, you want, really want to give it a decent haircut between 5 and 10 centimetres above the ground level every couple of weeks to keep it looking green and lush and full of those aromatic oils. You can have it either dried or fresh in a tea. You can also um, turn them into tinctures as well. With lemon balm, it's not as invasive as other mints. The root system doesn't crawl everywhere and try to get into all the other places like other mints do. And it's really good for being contained in a pot. It does not like frost though. <laughs> lemon balm does not like frost. Passionflower, not to be confused with the plant passion fruit. Passionflower is Passiflora incarnata, which is the one that we use medicinally. It originates in South America, and to have it here in Australia, you have to import it or buy from a place that grows it here in Australia. It's known as the purple maypop, so you, the difference between the passion fruit and the passion flower that we use medicinally is pretty evident, and it's by the purple colour of the actual flower. That's how we know it to be passionflower. All of the passion flower aerial parts are usable. So we use the leaf and the flower as a tea or a tincture. Like lemon balm, it's a nervine. 
and it's good for anxiety and calming the central nervous system. It's also fantastic for sleep, so it helps to regulate the sleep cycle. Yeah, because um, it's a nervine, it's good for people with ADHD for concentration and cognition um, and anxiety and those sorts of things. It's an accumulator, meaning that it accumulates in your body. So you don't just have it as a one-off like you would with a sleeping tablet. If you have it daily, it will accumulate in your body and scientific studies have now shown it will help you to sleep deeper and longer. With passionflower, it grows prolifically. If you put it in a pot, it will grow out of the pot. It'll take over anywhere that you possibly let it grow. So you want to put it up on bricks, on concrete, possibly above the house so it cannot escape. It is really naughty and it will run away and take over your entire garden. With passionflower, ideally you want to grow it on a trellis or a fence or a water tank or something that you're trying to cover. I grow it on the side of my house. Like all of the other herbs, it lacks deep, rich alluvial soil. It actually loves a lot of water. Harvesting passionflower, when you chop it off at the base, don't think that that's the end because it's going to come back. If it dies off in winter, it will come back in spring probably two, three, four times more prolific. With all of these herbs that I'm growing, you can have them either as a tea or a tincture. So with medicinal herbs, you need to treat them as medicine. And these herbs are not suitable for women that are pregnant or breastfeeding, uh, especially pa passionflower. Last but not least is the hibiscus. Hibiscus is good for liver cleansing, blood pressure. It makes a really beautiful tea. Hepato protective, so it means that it's, it cleanses the liver and it's good for fatty liver and those sorts of things. I think of it as like nature's hangover cure and it helps to cleanse the body of free radicals. With hibiscus, you use the bright red fruit calyx. It's a fantastic source of vitamin C and the leaf as a fantastic source of, of iron. The, Indians use it in curries because it's such a high source of um, fibre as well as iron. They will eat it in curries and stews. The fruit calyx mix with the leaf. It has the vitamin C and the iron, but it's really beautiful because it makes it a little bit more mellow. So sometimes the hibiscus tea of the calyx, of the fruit calyx alone, is really, really sort of like tart, like cranberry, a little bit too bitter. If you mix it in with the leaf, it just sort of mellows it down and just is a really nice balance of flavours. So with hibiscus, it comes up in flower as this beautiful sort of creamy yellow flower. And then as it sort of dies away, it becomes a seed pod. And then over the top of the seed pod is a bright red fruit calyx. And that's the part that we harvest. So we chop off that fruit calyx with the seed inside and you peel off the bright red fruit section and then you throw away or retain for keeping seeds the seed pod. So the seed pod is full of pectin so if you it's really good if you want to make jam. If you use them fresh in tea it's a little bit bitter so it's actually better to dry them out. It sort of um, crystallizes the sugar content and it's much sweeter. So to grow hibiscus you put the seeds in in early spring it likes a really long um, growing season so it likes full sun, rich alluvial soils, um, decent drainage. Uh, it can also sort of tolerate drier conditions as well, originating from in the Indias. They have a really high success rate of um, growth from seed. With hibiscus, you plant the seed about one centimetre deep and then you allow it to grow for about six months. That's when it'll start getting the beautiful bright red fruit calyxes on it. You start harvesting it when you have the fruit calyxes and the fruit calyxes are bright red and large. Um, from there, you can harvest it all the way until it starts to die off and that will be when it starts to get too cold. It's an annual, so when it gets too cold for it, it will just die. So last year I grew hibiscus and they came to about waist high. And this year I started using the lactobacillus bacteria that you taught me to grow weedy. And this time they're actually well over my head height. So yeah, really interesting. It's worked out really well. So the reason that I grow medicinal herbs is I want to empower people to take control of their own health. Medicinal herbs are very easy to grow and I want people to know where their medicine is coming from, be able to grow their own medicine and have that connection with what's going in their body. There's something really beautiful and holistic about giving your family members something that you've grown yourself. You know where it comes from and you're healing your family and yourself. I'd really like to grow all these herbs in my garden, actually. Do you have seeds and cuttings that I can take back to the weedy garden now? Yeah, I've got all of them. You can have some cuttings and some seeds. People just think of plants only as food, but they're so excited to learn that it's also medicine and it's so good for you and there's so many different things. So now that I've got my five medicinal herbs, 
I'm going to go over to the fire and I'm going to make a little billy. I'm going to make a tea out of one of them. You can drink your teas green or you can dry it. And then you can put it in a bottle in your kitchen and drink it all year round. So here's to thriving in your garden, returning back to nature and taking control of your own health. On the next video, I'll show you how to make tinctures out of these five herbs. Okay, be strong, love your lives everybody, because they're yours. Until then, have a nice day and I'll catch you later.